Everybody doing all right? It's weird to have this much sun this late already. Silly, silly daylight savings time. Um, so yeah, we talked about this uh, at the meetup two months ago. Um, this project that we've been working on at the company. Basically, we had a law firm that wanted to do internal document sharing and um, some, some, other, some other functionality, but that was the big piece of it. So we sort of rebuilt Dropbox, and part of that fun process was um, they have documents that they need to give to their clients to download and sign, and they need the doc those documents to not be modified. So first step was we had to convert everything to a PDF and lock it. And since we'd gotten that far, let's turn the PDF into PNGs and have previews in the browser, um, which seemed to be like, oh, this is going to be easy. We'll just go use somebody's API. And that wasn't the case at all. So um, looked at a bunch of ways to do it and finally came up with a system that works pretty well that's um, using a mix of open source software and some custom stuff and some pure Python and some calling out to other apps to do the work. And um, so I, we decided we'd do a talk about that. And I'm aware that my AWS keys are on the screen. They get you access to absolutely one thing that's completely pointless for this demo. So don't worry about that. Uh, I put this project up on GitHub at github.com slash dryan. And got to blow everything up so we can read it. So the, the basic stuff we're using here that's not Python, because there's standard like requirements file for the Python stuff. Um, we use a thing called uh, uniconv, which is a command line utility that adds a bunch of functionality around LibreOffice to get documents from one format to another. It's universal conversion. Uni universal conversion. Um, I don't know why it's not uniconv, but whatever. Um, so it, basically anything you can open in LibreOffice, you can use that to then open it and export it in anything else that it can deal with. So we can take all kinds of input formats and export them out to PDF. Uh, we then need LibreOffice itself, um, which is really easy to install in Ubuntu. It's apt-get, and it's a really pain in the ass to install on OS 10. But um, I actually recommend there's a branch of Homebrew that lets you install apps through Homebrew. And that is the only way this actually worked. It never worked when I was installing it from source or downloading the compiled file. It was awful. Um, GoScript uh, is a, PF, a PDF manipulation uh, shell utility that we use in this to take the PDFs and turn them into PNGs. And I first wrote a pure Python implementation of that, but it's like 20 times slower than the C library that's been around like 15 years. So it's well-worn, battle-tested. So we use that, and then uh, the last one is we use OptiPNG to then take the PNGs and optimize them to get the file size as low as we can, because these documents tend to be huge. So, so uh, the sample project is a Django app, but you can kind of take most of this work and go plug it into whatever Python framework you want. The actual work to do the previews is a standalone file that doesn't do too much that's Django-specific. And we'll get into what it is, what is specific. So the, the first thing we'll look at here is our models. Um, it's pretty straightforward. A document has a name. It has a unique identifier. And the reason we use a GUID is we don't want to expose numeric IDs and URLs so people can just try and crawl documents that don't belong to them, even though we obviously have better permissions than that. But it's just why I let them try. Uh, a date time field of when it was uploaded, the actual file field where we store the original document, and then um, a file path field to the PDF so that we, once we create the PDF, we save that where it lives to that. Uh, a couple other helpers, we got a, a MIME type that will look at the file and using the built-in Python thing, give you back what kind of file it is, which then we use in this icon method here. So in our, our UI, we um, display font awesome icons for each kind of file type. So this just goes through and does all the random uh, formats that it might come back as a MIME type to figure out which one of those icons it gets. And then there's a preview model. So for each image that we create off these previews, 
there's a model that saves the document it belongs to and the actual image field and the width and height so we can lay all that out correctly. And if at any point anybody's got questions, feel free to jump in and ask. Um, on Django, you have a, a, a field where you store a file. You can give it a callable to yield back the, the path that it saves to. So instead of just uploading to a standard folder where they're all mixed in together, we actually put the GUID into the path um, and then put the file name, the original file name and extension back into it. And the reason we do it that way is it keeps from having collision. So if I upload test.pdf and you upload test.pdf, they don't write on, write on top of each other, which is uh, something that will happen eventually when you have enough files. And then everybody's like, what the hell happened? Um, then for the, the preview one, it uh, just makes sure that it goes back to the document and uses the same GUID. So in, it's really hard to see on the screen because it, the way it blew up. So in our sample here, it's, you can see it's got this like crazy folder and it'll have the original file and the previews and the PDFs and all that stuff. So th the magic of this whole thing happens with uh, Django signals. So we've got a signal listener that every time a document's created, it dispatches out a job to go create all the previews. And there, you'll see there's two methods in this file for creating a preview. And the, the reason is, and, and we'll get into how this actually works here in a minute, but the, the first one just does it on the fly. It's, so the user sits and holds while the preview's created, and then it lets them keep going. For really big documents, that is really crappy because the browser will probably actually time out before it finishes. So the second one is to uh, run it as a celery task and put it into an asynchronous queue and then it, it'll just run in the background and when it's done, it's done. And this is configurable in a setting. Uh, if you want to download and play with this app, by the way, there's a config.json sample file in the repo with all the stuff that you need. Um, and then you just copy that to config.json and fill out your actual details. So. Um, this is how we try to do, I've been through like 10 ways to do different environment settings in Django and they all, they all kind of blow. And this is the one that we're using currently that's, uh, that works pretty well for us. So in our settings file, we just import that file, we load it with JSON, and then everywhere that we need to actually read from the config, we just call it out of the config file. So. Just it makes it easier to get, uh, have different environment settings and have one settings file instead of having five settings file or having some kind of environment variable that switches your, your environment around, which is what everybody was doing for a couple of years. This is the one thing that like Django's never been good at that Rails has always been great at is the whole multiple environment thing. And it would be great if they actually solved that at some point. Um, this last setting is the, the one in the system that tells it if you should do synchronous or asynchronous previews. So if you want to try it both ways, you can and see the difference. So the signal, you see if you're doing the synchronous one, it actually just calls another function because there's so many steps to doing the previews that I want to stub that out into its own file. So I'll bring that up now and we'll kind of walk through this. So because it's a Django project, um, we don't actually operate directly with any of the normal file system stuff. We use the, the storage system in Django so that uh, like in, in our actual production environment for this project, it, everything's stored to Amazon S3. And that works totally differently than if you're storing it locally to open all these files and do all this. But by using the default storage as the intermediary, it all just works. It'll go download the file back from S3 if you want to do local work on it and then put it back up when you're done. Um, so if you were going to port this to Flask or something like that, you'd have to deal with where are you storing it, how are you storing it, and how do you want to open the files. Uh, this first thing here is um, it's actually borrowed from Python 3 because it's built into Python 3, but it's a, a way to escape um, shell command and make sure that you don't get anything in there that's going to compromise the system. Um, and these functions are actually in backwards order, so we'll go down to the bottom where the preview actually works. And go back through them. So this is the, the method that actually creates the previews. So you pass in the document model, um, and the first thing it does is look at, to figure out what kind of 
uh, mime type it is. And then if it's an image, uh, that's actually fairly straightforward. We don't have to do a bunch of like conversion work and we can do that pretty much all in Python. So if it's an image, we start off um, by declaring a string IO. And if you don't know string IO, it's basically a, it looks like a file object, but it's actually a string. It's all in memory. It keeps us from to save these things to disk while we're doing all this work. And there's the original string IO module, and then there's a C string IO module, and you should always use C string IO because it's way faster because it's written in C. And then the um, next line is the PNG file we're actually going to create, and you stub that out. And content file is another part of the Django storages mechanism. So if you were not going to save this in Django, you would just open up a new file and save it. And then we read that out in chunks and write it to the new file, uh, to our copy. And then on uh, 141, you rewind that back to the beginning. Otherwise, the next thing will totally error out with a blank image. Uh, you take the standard pillow image library and you open the image that you just uh, pulled down, copy it, make a thumbnail of it. We make our thumbnails a thousand by a thousand. Um, the thumbnail function will always do the longest side. So if you do a thousand by a thousand, the, the longest, tallest or widest it's going to be is a thousand, then it keeps the ratio together. So it just saves you a ton of math by using that one. Um, then we split out the extension and file name from the um, original file so that we can take the file name and then save it as a PNG. Uh, we save that uh, preview in a PNG format. It's on 146. And then we send that over to the storage system and tell it to save, and we add the name preview so we don't accidentally collide with anything. Um, the one thing that I actually haven't done here that we should, I should do is if it is a PNG, we should probably just use that as the preview. Um, although the resizing thing is useful, so leave that up to you. Uh, and the other bug we ran into the other day is um, one of the servers didn't get libjpeg installed, so it couldn't, do, it couldn't process a JPEG. So make sure when you build Pillow that it actually tells you it has all the different formats installed, and if, do, if it doesn't, go do that. Um, so this next check here, the 152, is we're looking to see if this file's a local file or not. If it's local, then we run optpng on it with the command line. If it's not, we actually don't worry about it because um, it's too much of a pain to go download the file just to get a little bit of compression out of it. And then this last one's this weird little Django thing. So because it has the same name uh, as the original, when you do the create function on it, it will create it a new copy of it and append a number to it, which is not what we want. So we actually take the file we just made and destroy it. And then we save it again, which is this silly hack to work around Django's the fact that you can't force it to override the file that exists. So for non-images, uh, if it's a PDF, we actually don't need to do anything. We just save the PDF uh, path and go. And if it's not, then we run another method called doc to PDF that we'll go back and look at now, because this is where it starts to get into all the weird crap that takes whatever file format it is, turns it into a PDF. So that one is here. So the first thing this does is uh, copies that file that was uploaded to a temporary file because you don't want to work on the original for many reasons, but mostly being if something happened during this process and you accidentally destroyed the file, you don't want to have lost the file the person uploaded. Um, it's Interesting to, to look at this function. There's built-in temp file support in Python, and that would like, be the thing that you would normally just like, oh, it can make me a temporary file, write this thing to it, and go. The problem is, like, as soon as you close that file, when you made the temporary file, it deletes it off the file system, and we have to pass it around between a bunch of processes here, and so it was getting deleted like halfway through sometimes, and only sometimes. So instead, write our own method that creates a temporary directory with a unique ID, passes that around to the whole thing, and then at the end just deletes it and cleans it up, which is a pain because it adds like 100 lines of code to a project where it should be like one line of code. But sometimes you wonder if anybody writing these languages actually uses them for real world stuff. But, um, so once you've gotten the uh, 
the local copy here, and then it sets the, the actual directory path to temp. We first make sure that the local doc got created. So this file, the, the, this function will return none if it couldn't copy it for some reason. Because um, you, you, know, you never want to start working on something that doesn't exist. And then we set up the you know, unocon v function. So it's, it's a command line, right? It's unocon v, and then the first argument is the input file mat, or the output format is PDF. And then you give it the original file. And then it's going to run that through subprocess. And this is dirty, and we should never actually just do accept exception, right? Except that there's like 300 ways for this to fail, apparently. So in this case, it's like I'm not going to sit here and enumerate every way in which that process call could fail. Just get it done. And then, uh, and our finally here, if this goes through and renames the original file, changes it to a PDF extension, checks to make sure that that file actually got made, does the whole, make a dummy file string, copy it into it, save it to the file system, create it in the Django way, um, sets this PDF variable to that file, and then returns it back. I actually commented this out earlier because I was having some debugging trouble and making sure that I wasn't removing it too fast, but I finally got that fixed, so I got to turn that back on. So then back down here, um, once the PDF's made, then it runs the PDF to PNG function, which is another big fun one here. So again, it takes the PDF and makes a copy of it so that we don't screw up the PDF we just made if something goes wrong. Uh, does some, uh, some more stuff with the file name. And then it runs GoScript, which is in old school Unix style, has a two letter name that's completely meaningless. It doesn't tell you anything, but it's GS. And uh, it's also old enough that these arguments are really crazy. It's single character. You can't put a space between them. Um, so basically what we're doing here is telling it to do, um, it has a, different modes for how it does the conversion and safer is the one that won't execute code from a PDF, which obviously we don't want to execute code to PDF and why is there code to PDF? And I discovered you can have JavaScript in a PDF and that's stupid. Um, and then the no prompt just says if you've got any questions for me, assume I said yes and keep going. Um, this was a weird one to me, it uses the term device to denote what format you want to output to. I don't know why they call it a device and not a format, but whatever. And there's more than one PNG format, which isn't actually true in the real world. There's only one PNG format, but this is the one that works. Um, oh, the other weird thing about these things, the dash D and dash S tells it what kind of variable it's going to get. Uh, I, I've never seen an argument in a system like this before. Um, the text alphabets is another one that I stumbled upon in doing this a bunch. Um, it, you can set the transparency, like anti-aliasing of the text and the graphics separate in its conversion. By setting it to four, you're getting four, the full four bits, so you get like the nice, clean anti-aliasing on everything. Same thing with graphics. We do it at 144 resolution, um, so it's uh, retina ready, and then pass in the file name that it saves to, and then pass the, the original PDF file to it. So then it calls this, looks for the exceptions, and then goes through and lists out the directory to find all of the PNGs that were just created, because nicely enough, this command doesn't tell you what it just did, it just does it. So we have to then go look for the directory, assume everything in there that's a PNG is ours, um, run the opti PNG on that again, and then this part's the same method we, you've seen a couple times where we take it, copy it, put it into Django, and save it. So blah, blah code, right? That's boring. So we'll actually show one of these here. Hopefully it all works. Um, this is the standard Django admin with a nice little skin on it. I really can't see any of that. The first one we'll do is just a PNG file. So it's just going to go through and immediately uh, optimize it and be done with it. This is a little simple front end I made for today. Let me blow that up where you can see it. 
So if I click on the, the file, I get this message that the previews are being created, or I'll see a preview here. So I probably should be running Celery so it can make the preview. back through and do another one. Uh, there's a couple things in this sample project that we, I haven't gotten ported over yet from the original one. So one of the things we do on our live project is we have a list of supported files that we, ex we take, like we don't take zip files for instance because they can be executable, a bunch of stuff like that. And so when you, there's a um, uh, validation on the form to actually go through and check the file not just the file name, but check the file and make sure it's legitimate, it's a type we can handle, and then throws an error if it's not. And we do that both server side and client side. So we hook into the, some JavaScript events. So when that file input changes, we go through the same list on the client side. That's all name-based, because you really don't want to start reading huge documents in JavaScript and watch Chrome just burn through all your RAM. Um, but if, if, the, if the extension doesn't match, then it will at least kick back an error then and tell them it doesn't support it. The other nice thing it does is it fills out the name for you from the name of the file from JavaScript, so you don't have to type the name in. See there, with the queue actually running, it copied over the PNG I uploaded, optimized it, resized it, but PNGs aren't hard, right? So let's do something a little more fun. This is a docx file. So this is the modern like Word file that's XML based. And there was actually a bunch of options out there in pure Python if you didn't have to deal with docx and XLSX and all the like modern ones. So that was part of the journey to get here. And See if that one's done yet. So now we sit here and wait for the thing to finish. Um, yeah. So which file types take the longest to process? Uh, it's not really types that take any longer than anything else. It's size, um, and so the the bigger the document, the longer it's going to take to process. And uh, one of the things that's true in if you're developing on a Mac versus when it's actually running on like a production server. Um, if you have like the debug mode on in Django, so it like reloads your code whenever you hit save. If you hit save while it's processing, it screws everything up. And it just, LibreOffice hangs off to the side, you have to go force quit it, your fan will start burning and you know, use all your electricity in your house. So I had to get really used to like, hit save, wait for it to tell me it's done, and then I can go work again. Um, and it, it, it's, it doesn't do that in the queuing mode because the queue will just keep running in the background and it's fine, and which is part of the reason I built the queue was so I could work faster. But if you're running it in like the direct write mode, you just have to wait till it's done or it errors. Um, so this one should be getting done sh soon. Um, the samples I'm using I actually got from um, a bunch of different places for sample files for, um, it's an ebook uh, program for reading ebooks and converting them. I can't remember now what the name of it is, but it's this open source project for taking documents, converting them to ebooks, and their, their repo has like all these sample files with all kinds of problems in them and like graphics and fonts and embedded and different stuff. So it's a pretty nice uh, collection of stuff to make sure this thing works right. Let's see if this guy's done. Nope. So there's no telling how long that's going to take, but this is another fun sample file I made that is uh, a four gig text file that's actually empty see how it would handle that. And it indeed just makes one empty page.
when it does what it's supposed to do. Which it's still going to take a while to do. But. And here you can again see the icons. We got off those line types we talked about earlier. What's the, I don't remember what my other format is here. Oh, CSV. This is a fun one. Just turns it into a big table and shows it. So it looks like my queue is just hanging out, and I don't really know why. But um, there's probably still some bugs in this open source version because uh, the client we did this for is a law firm, so that's not the people you want to piss off with stealing their code. So like rewriting this whole thing from scratch, uh, I probably missed some stuff in there somewhere. But let me see if I oh, no, I don't have my login on this user. I'm just going to show, log you in and show you the, um, I don't actually think I know that password, which is scary. This is the actual app we built it for. Uh, it's still in beta with the client. You can see here what they actually kind of look like when they're done. I'm going to scroll through that fast. We don't give away any internal info that I'm not supposed to be giving away. Go back. Here's that demo file we uploaded on the other one. So it actually does a fairly decent job with different typefaces and colors and layouts and all the Calibre. That's the program I was trying to think of a minute ago. Um, this is some sort of weird programmatically created green dot that it makes that apparently a lot of things choke on. Um, so basically, if you can make this file render, you've done a pretty good job. And somewhere in here, I've got a spreadsheet we can look at. Racist email index, Jesus. There's some stuff in here. Um, Where's that spreadsheet I just passed? There it is. Oh, he uploaded a blank. Oh, there it is. Yeah, so even a sp an Excel spreadsheet with colors and things like that in it, it does a fairly good job of turning that into a table that you can preview. And then we've got some other permissions in here. So like uh, when you click a download button, you get, actually get redirected through a URL that checks all your permissions and then gives you either the PDF or the original document, depending on if you're the owner or not. And counts how many times it was downloaded. So when you go in and look at a file, you can, there's a log of how many times the client downloaded it, how many times it was uploaded. We do versions and we do all kinds of fun stuff in here. So that's really how it works. Um, I think the interesting things are doing the queue stuff because I'm always all about queuing stuff asynchronously. Uh, and Celery, if you've not worked with that, it works really well in Python. And we actually use Amazon's simple queue service as the storage engine for that. So we don't have to set up any kind of database or any of that. We don't have to worry about sharing it across all of our app servers. It just pushes everything out there. Whenever there's a notification, it broadcasts it out. And Amazon makes sure that only one server gets a copy of the job. So not, we don't have every server running the same jobs. And makes that pretty simple. And the first place I used that for was actually um, email notifications for a project where we queued that off, and it's a really silly name project called C Cucumber that is a drop-in for Django that just gives you queued emails from the system. Um, and then we built a version of that for SMSs, and now a version of that for document previews. Um, and so did we actually look at what that signal looks like? I think I skipped that part for the queuing. Yeah, so that's not it, that's the signal. So this is making a celery task is just this simple. Um, you inherit from a, a task on a knit. You set a few settings on it, like how many times can it retry to do this job? How long should it take between retries? Uh, how many should it do at a time? 
and because you could actually have one task run multiple copies of itself at a time, um, but that gets really tricky to manage. And then you define a run method that just takes whatever arguments you want to take and does whatever you want it to do. And in this case, we just run the same function that's in our utilities file. So it's the, the asynchronous thing is really like that simple. Um, and it's nice because it retries. So if something goes wrong because the server ran out of space or whatever, it doesn't go away. Um, I think our you set your, your timeout in Amazon for it. I think we have 30 days. So we can have like a problem over an overnight where it can't make any previews and then we'll just pick them up when it comes back online. Um, the next thing I actually want to try with this would be super interesting is uh, Amazon AWS Lambda came out like right after we started working on this, which is um, basically workers that they spin up for you on demand and in response to events that happen inside your other Amazon properties. It's all Node, which is why I haven't done it because I'm not familiar enough with Node to feel like I could go do document previews in Node. But basically, um, when we saved the original file to S3, it would get a notification that file was created and then go kick off a task and do it and we could have actually not written any of this like management side of the, of the queuing process. It would just do it for you. Um, and I'm told by little birdies who work at Amazon that Python will be there before the end of the year. But right now, like, everything at Amazon is like, AWS is all built off stuff Amazon itself does. So like Elastic Transcoder came online and they launched Amazon Prime Video. And it's like, oh, right, if you just watch what they're selling on AWS, it's something that they just came up with they need for Amazon.com. And so they're starting to switch stuff to Node, which is why it's in Node first, uh, which is really interesting. And then, but most of their people work, work on Python, so at some point they'll get Python support. But, um, so something in Amazon's going asynchronous. Who knows what it is, but. Um, anybody have questions, thoughts, comments, tomatoes to throw? First question is prize. Another slice of pizza. Oh no, you actually have a prize, prize, yeah. yeah. It could be unrelated. Yeah. <laughs> it could just be a question. I guess you get it, Justin. Awesome. Free book for Justin. <laughs> yeah, totally. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, we are, um, most of their cases are health related. So we are HIPAA compliant too. Um, and basically if you hit HIPAA compliance, you're, you're covered on all the other legal compliance laws. So um, if you have spent any time working with me at all, you know I'm a huge AWS fan. And AWS is all HIPAA compliant by default. And you have to, I think they finally made this public because you, you have to sign a business agreement to be HIPAA compliant, and it used to be that they wouldn't do that. So they would do that as long as you do some of the work there. <coughs> and once your account becomes active, like you spent 100 bucks on it, like they'll reach out to you and give you a rep, and then that rep would do it. But you had to know to ask. Uh, I just happened to have friends who work there because of the campaign. So I asked him, I was like, can you just do HIPAA compliance? Like, yeah, here's the form. Sweet, we're done. Um, so the, the specific things we do on this is all of the files are stored in read-only mode by the owner. And then part of what happens with that download link and what happens even in the previews is it generates a five second access key on the fly to view it. And if you were sophisticated, you could get in there and download that file anyway. But like we've done some tricks so that if you right click and try to save that image, it actually just saves a blank GIF. Um, won't do it. So if you dug in the way of web inspector at the network panel and looked at it, if you did it fast enough to do it before the timeout expired, you could download it, or you grab it in your browser cache. But at that point, we've done due diligence to protect it, and that's enough under the, the law. Um, so the, the storage is that the servers are all encrypted, the databases are all encrypted, everything's SSL all the way through 
you know, even inter, inter app communications, SSL, it's SSL, we'll do the queuing. Um, the permission stuff, we had to get audited by the party, make sure that we're actually enforcing permissions correctly, and we weren't. So that's fine. Turns out if you were a staff member, you could see everybody's stuff, everybody's emails, whether you're supposed to or not. Fun was an email stuff. Um, yeah, that's, that's most of it. It used to be more of a pain when doing encryption at rest on databases was a lot harder than it is now, like doing an encrypted field and all that. And now that we can like encrypt the entire database transparently, like you don't have to really worry about saving social security numbers, that kind of stuff. Um, and then on top of all that, we actually tell the the law firm tells all of its people don't open the back in the system. So if they do it, they're technically violating the terms of service and we're not at fault. But uh, you, you got to try to protect it anyway. You don't know what the end users are going to put up. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. It's three does out. Yeah, their encryption is really nice. They just added um, encryption at rest to RDS yeah. for the databases, which is super nice. And it's a checkbox. Yeah. I'd like to be encrypted. And then it manages the keys and everything for you. You can provide your own keys if you don't want them to know what it is. You can let them generate the key. You can let them rotate keys. You can put a rotation policy in, rotate keys every, you know, every day if you wanted to. Um, which I think would get really tedious to decrypt and re-encrypt the drive every day, but um, yeah, there's a bunch of stuff like that that I really dig. If you're if you don't have access to a database at rest system, you can do something like this. Um, there's a, a library from Django that's an encrypted field that uses decrypt to to do everything. The one thing we haven't done, just we're not required to by any of these. Uh, policies and laws, but that I want to do because I know it's possible now is to have the actual uh, keys to access all that stuff be in encrypted RAM on the system so that like, you'd actually like, have to be a root user with an SSH cert to get in and actually see them. And at some point, like, at some point, the things in memory, as long as you can get access to the box, you can look at the RAM. Like, but there's steps to take to make sure that, like, it's not sitting in a file somewhere. Like, that stuff. Um, and it's, some, it's sitting somewhere, though, because how does it get in RAM on the servers, right? It's somewhere there's a system that has the key that's handing it out. So at what point do you just give up and say, it's okay that it lives here, but not here? Uh, I think more as a academic procedure, I want to figure out if we can not store the keys locally. <laughs> yeah, I've been doing a lot of those academic things lately. Like, can I do this? Like, I wrote a an app for a client last week that is like just sits at like a wildcard subdomain, and so if you put in documents dot their domain, it goes and sees if slash documents exists, and it'll redirect you there if it does. If it doesn't, it takes you to the home page, and it does it for like the five domains they own. And I built it all in Flask, and it was like, that's pretty snappy. It's only like 10 milliseconds to respond. And, you know. and uh, I was like, oh, I wonder if Node would be faster. At the end of the day, I'd written it seven times in seven languages, and then speed <laughs> tests on all of them, and Flask was the fastest. And uh, the only thing that was faster was I did a version purely in Nginx that didn't verify that the page existed. That was faster, because we're doing it one time. But, I don't want to just assume that what I always write is the right thing to write. So, and that was a simple enough thing. Like, I think the longest version of that app was 30 lines of code. So, let's write seven of them and speed test them. <laughs> I was texting uh, Florida over for a while. I was like, guess what I'm doing? Do you want to test some stuff with me? I've never even written Go before. I like, learned enough Go to try it and Go. I heard it was really great at networking, so I thought I'd give it a shot. Um, yeah. Anybody else got anything? So, what do you use for the hosting of Django sites? It's all, we do all AWS stuff, so Amazon Web. Um, it, it's the simplest thing to do. And uh, I'm actually working on, we do a bunch of WordPress sites too. So, we do WordPress if you're just doing a pretty static website, because it's just less overhead, and everybody knows how to use it in the industry. Like, 
most of our clients, we build them a WordPress site. We don't have to train them. Like everybody there knows how to work WordPress. Um, we're actually starting. You don't even know this yet because it's a thing I started on today. And these academic exercises. We're doing a WordPress plugin that when you save anything in WordPress, it copies the whole thing out statically to S3, and we actually just serve from that. So we run one server that's the admin, that's VPN, so only the people at the office can get on it, and then it generates out static HTML. That doesn't work in every scenario, but it works for almost all of our clients because we don't do comments, we don't do anything like that. Um, and all you need is the admin, so you know you can run the admin that way. And as much as I would like to do Jekyll for everybody's websites, I can't ask these people to learn Markdown and build websites on the fly. So uh, we're doing the same thing with some of the so with the Django apps. Most of our Django apps with the dynamic stuff, it's the services that power the the more static sites. So they'll always be on Amazon. We run them you know, purely on EC2, Ubuntu. Um, it's pretty straightforward. In fact, if you curl config.dryan.net and pipe it through a shell, it'll set up an Ubuntu server for you with everything you need. Because I got tired of doing that over and over again, so I just put it on a server. Um, yeah, we do that with auto scaling and everything else. And the nice thing is Django, like, when the, I'm always dating myself because I've done this too long, but when I started writing Python, like, you had to reboot Python every hour or the memory leaks and Mod Python would take down Apache. You couldn't run, let it run forever. And now it's just, it's super efficient. So we run everything on micros. They're like 400 megs of RAM and, you know, only enough file storage for the actual app because we save all the files out to S3 so that they're shared across app servers. If we pre-buy them, they're about four bucks a month to run. And so, like, I think I own like 300 of them right now and across all of our clients. And it doesn't cost hardly anything to operate, and they just scale up and down at, at will. And uh, they're all SSD based. They're super fast to boot. We do AMIs every code build. So when it when it auto scales up, it's up and running in about 15 seconds. And so it, it, that's it's been really great. Like I don't really have to worry about it anymore. Um, and then anything we have that has traffic on it, we put varnish or a CDN in front of it as well. So you don't even get a, you don't even get that much traffic to the origin servers. So I think our, our heaviest app right now runs three micros simultaneously to handle the daily traffic, and, and that's it. And everything else is two. And we do two because you never want a single point of failure, and two is overkill for almost everything we do. Like, you know, you still... No, two servers. So we run two, two instances at the same time. And we only do that because if one goes down, I don't want to have a panic from a client while their server's down. So, um, and at four bucks a month, like, okay. I'll have a, I'll have a redundant backup. Um, yeah, I'm just like in, I've learned all that DevOps stuff just doing it in the last year and a half. I was around some really smart people that I picked up on and um, it's, it's an interesting world. But like I just learned the other day that in auto scaling, you can do standby servers so you can actually keep servers hot but aren't getting traffic until they need to get traffic and you don't pay for them. Um, they're, in, they're in stopped mode. And so from stop to start is like less than 10 seconds. Um, so they're basically like warm copies that you can keep running. Uh, if you do, what do they call it, Opsworks, which is sort of their infrastructure like platform they bought from somebody that handles all this interface for you. You can actually do time-based auto-scaling too. You can, if you know you're gonna have high traffic at prime time every night, you can tell it to spin up two extra servers every night at seven o'clock, like just preemptively get them there. Um, I don't like Opsworks. It doesn't work with Python very well, which is really weird because it's Amazon, but they bought the whole platform from somebody else who didn't support Python. So uh, it's a real pain to get working, but it's like, it's Chef and all that stuff. So if you can run Chef and all that, you put your recipes in and it manages the databases and all the servers and puts all the keys where they belong and it's all role-based and that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, it's, it's an interesting system. But. Hey, George. How are you? Good, how are you? Good. Did you know I was out here talking? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Yeah, right on. George is our biz dev guy. Because our office is like over there. 
that I'm never at. Never. I got work to do. I got work to do. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you. appreciate everybody. You know what we're going to talk about next next month? Next month, you exactly what we're about, but I know Adrian Rogers He's going to be rad. It'll be something over my head and awesome. It'll be, it'll be over my head and awesome. That's it. Nice. Yeah. I yeah. sort of tangentially understand what that means, and I like it. In any case. Yeah. 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 Wait for the Internet of Andrew. That's what I want. Yeah, that'll be next one. Cool. And if anybody wants to speak the following month, let me know. Totally do it. Totally, totally do it. Totally do it. I'm too afraid of live code, by the way. That's why. <laughs> I've seen that go the wrong way too many times. I also can't type for shit when people are watching me. I, I misspelled my own name logging into the website a minute ago. Oh, yeah. Sorry, you're not doing the one. Yeah, I do it all the time. Thanks. Yeah, so much, Daniel.